Hey everyone, this is Vishnu J, ACCA, a proud Fintrammer who's been teaching students across the globe and across designations. And I welcome you all to this session where we will be doing two things. Okay, folks, what are these two things? First of all, we will be debriefing a question from one of the most recent past exams. Okay, folks, and that'll help you understand how to tackle an audit risk question as well as a substantive procedure question when it comes to your uh, AA exam. But that's not all. Okay, folks, we will be covering one more thing. After debriefing this particular question, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you with a set of questions that you have to practice in the upcoming days that can well prepare you for your uh, upcoming AA exam. Okay, folks, so this is basically what we will be covering in the session. So let's get started with the question debrief, shall we? So guys, as you can see over here, I have a question taken from the uh, September, December 2023 double exam setting. And what we will be doing is we're going to be doing the first 30 mark question from this particular past paper. Now, what is the first thing that we have to do? When it comes to any case study question in any of the ACC exams, the first thing that we do is read the requirement, isn't it? So let's read through the requirement here. Okay, folks, for this particular 30 mark question, we have four sets of requirements. Okay, folks, so first of all, let's read requirement A, which is kind of a generic theory question, I would say. So let's read it one by one, shall we? Uh, briefly explain how each of the following sources of information will be used by Hercules and Co. to gain an understanding of the Knight Electronics Co. at the planning stage of the audit. Okay, so and we have a list of source of information provided to us such as the prior year audited financial statements, current year budgets and management accounts, prior year report to management, board meeting minutes, as well as company website as well. So for each of these sources of information, how exactly do we use it to gain an understanding of the client? Okay, folks, that's basically as to what this particular requirement requires us to do, isn't it? Simple as that. Okay, what about the next one? I'm just gonna scroll down these and then move on to the next one. Yeah, there we go. We have to describe eight audit risks and explain the auditor's response to each of these risks in the planning of uh, Knight Electronics Co. And this is for 16 marks. So eight uh, audit risks and 16 marks. That's something that's uh, you know familiar with us, isn't it? As in, uh, we will have one mark for writing the audit risks as well as one mark for the auditor's response as well. Isn't it? Simple as that. So, uh, yeah. So we have to identify eight risks from the scenario, a typical audit risk question, I would say. And uh, what else? We have uh, two more requirements. One is describe audit, sorry, substantive procedures the auditor should perform to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence in relation to uh, night electronic cause revenue as well. So we have to write substantive procedures in relation to uh, the revenue aspect in the scenario as well. And this is for five marks. And, you know, while reading the requirement, while seeing the marks, you can plan your answer as well. So five marks basically means that you have to write five procedures in this particular, for this particular account, isn't it? So just keep that in mind. And there's one last requirement. I'll just quickly uh, go through that as well. ISA 220, the auditor's responsibility relating to fraud in an audit of financial statements provide guidance for auditors regarding fraud and error. Auditors must obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence regarding the assessed risk of material misstatement due to fraud through designing and implementing appropriate responses, which is a generic, uh, you know, theoretical knowledge which we have learned when we uh, went through these ISA, uh, ISA standards, isn't it? So that doesn't really give us much, but what exactly is the requirement here? What you have to do here is you have to describe the procedures, like what procedures should be undertaken during the audit of Knight Electronic Co. as a result of the payroll fraud. So there was some payroll fraudulent activity happening in the scenario. So we can only answer this once we obtain an understanding of that of that particular event, isn't it? So just keep that in mind. And this is for four marks. So we just have to write four relevant points in relation to that fraud risk as per ISA 240. Okay, folks, simple as that. So all of these four requirements will constitute up to 30 marks. So let's read the scenario. Now that we understood what all things we need to look at, we can simply read the scenario and then start answering our questions, isn't it? While reading the scenario, what are the things that we should keep in mind, guys? First of all, uh, 
well, the first requirement is kind of generic, like we've already known as to what all uh, or, or how we obtain an understanding from these documents that are provided over here, right? So that's kind of straightforward. But what we have to keep an eye out for is, first of all, audit risks. Okay, folks, so whenever we identify an audit risk, we highlight that in the scenario. And then, uh, you know, there's some aspect in relation to revenue as well. There might be some story behind that. We need to, uh, you know, keep a close eye out for that particular event. And then there's a payroll fraud as per the requirement as well, isn't it? So just let's just carefully consider that particular event as well from the scenario. Okay, folks. So let's read through the scenario and understand what the situation is, shall we? So I'll just expand this so that we can easily read through each of these one by one and zoom in a, in a little bit as well. So yeah, let's go through it. What's the situation? It is 1st of July 2000x5. Okay, so this is basically the current date. I'll just highlight that. Whenever reading the scenario, highlight all the relevant information. Okay, folks, so just keep that in mind. Your firm, Hercules & Co. That's basically the audit firm, isn't it? And uh, what the, who is the audit client? Knight Electronics Co. We can just get it from the name itself, right? If it's Anco, then it's an audit firm. If it's just Co, then it's basically the client, isn't it? And yeah, so they have recently won an audit of a new client, Knight Electronics Co. Have I identified something? Most definitely, yes, isn't it? This is a new client, isn't it? Whenever we take up an audit of a new client, there's always an audit risk, isn't it? So just we can we can mention that particular point, right? So that's the first risk that I would mention out of the eight risks that I, I need to find out, right? And what else? For the year ending, 30th September 2000X5. That's the year end, isn't it? So just keep that in mind. Don't assume that it's going to be Jan to December or anything like that. Now, what else? Knight Electronics Co. sells products enabling smart building systems which allow customers to efficiently control their security, lighting, and networking needs. Okay, that's their business model. And what else? The audit manager held a preliminary meeting with the finance director and has provided you with the following notes. Okay, what all notes did he provide me with? Let's have a look. Since its launch five years ago, Knight Electronics Co. has experienced high level of growth such that the founder and CEO, William Knight, is considering a stock exchange listing next year. That's a really re relevant point. Why exactly is that? Does it contribute to our requirement in relation to the uh, substantive procedures? No, not really. That doesn't really do much, right? Payroll fraud? No. But it is an audit risk, isn't it? So I'll just uh, highlight that for the moment. What else? Knight Electronics Co. has both in both corporate and domestic customers. And on 1st October 2004, Knight Electronics Co. began to offer customers with the option to purchase a three-year servicing agreement. All right. So there's a three-year servicing agreement. And what else? This provides three annual services for products purchased and customers pay for the service agreement in full at the start of, of the agreement. So this is their revenue model, isn't it? We've understood the company's revenue model. Now, there would be accounting implications due to this particular factor, isn't it? Because we're getting the revenue for three years at the beginning of that particular three year time period, isn't it? So when exactly is revenue recognized? That could be a risk, isn't it? So I'll just highlight that. What else? Component parts are purchased from a number of suppliers. Okay, which is fine. And uh, prices of components have been steadily increasing over the past two years, leading to a reduction in the gross profit margin. Okay, understandable. That's a business issue. Now, but does the auditor uh, need to consider anything in relation to it? Let's have a look. The forecast financial statements for the year ended 30th September 2000 X5 show inventory valued at cost. Hmm. Okay, so there might be like, well, the prices of components have, uh, have been steadily increasing over the past two years. See, that particular aspect is fine with this, as in, you know, that's a normal business scenario and the auditor doesn't need to concern, uh, you know, anything about that particular aspect, isn't it? However, the auditor's focus is on the financial statements. And in the financial statement, my question as an auditor would be, has the inventory been valued appropriately? Right. So that's basically a question that I could, uh, you know, definitely ask uh, as an auditor. 
because you know i can't question the increase in uh, price of components or anything but i can definitely question the uh the uh, inventory value that is shown within the financial statement isn't it that's what the auditors do isn't it so i'll just keep up uh, keep a note of that and what else in june 2000x5 night electronics co decided to revalue its premises which had previously been accounted for using the historic cost model okay so there's revaluation as well properties with a carrying amount under the cost model of 38 3 3.8 million can't see, seem to see the uh, decimal point over there 3.8 million were revalued to 8.4 million based on the valuation performed by the management so the management had performed the valuation and there is therefore a risk that they may overvalue stuff as well isn't it why would they overvalue their uh, overvalue their uh, you know land or premises basically to overstate the asset isn't it that's a possibility isn't it so we can write uh, write it as a risk and what else the finance director also carried out an extensive review of non current asset lives and decided to extend the useful life of plant and uh, plant and equipment from 5 years to 8 years that's that's a high risk scenario isn't it because they're increasing useful life what happens when you increase useful life how is depreciation calculated cost minus res residual value divided by useful life isn't it so if useful life increases if the denominator increases depreciation decreases right and if depreciation decreases that means that the expense is reducing and if ep expense is understated right if the expense is understated what would happen to the profit it will be overstated isn't it so that's basically the situation here it's definitely a risk i can raise this issue as well and what else in may 2005 defective equipment used by night electronics co resulted in a small fire at its premises which is bad isn't it and uh, what exactly is the audit implication here let's have a look the company has commenced legal action against the supplier of the equipment okay a legal action so probably a provision maybe but we are you know suing the supplier isn't it let's read it completely night electronics co lawyers have advised that the legal action is likely to be successful and as a result the finance director has included a receivable for the damages likely to be received from the supplier for the forecast financial statements is that something that we need to include in the financial statements hmm if i revise my accounting standards properly i definitely know that this should not be the case why exactly is that because guys if you remember as per ias 37 ki folks we recognize uh, a provision ki folks if there is an estimated outflow from the organization or if there is a probable estimated outflow from the organization isn't it however we're getting the money here right we're not paying the money we're getting the money here isn't it so is it a liability for us no not really isn't it so it cannot be considered as a provision and neither can it be considered as a contingent liability as well isn't it but what should it be considered as ideally it should be a contingent asset okay folks because contingent assets should ideally be disclosed in the financial statement it should not be included okay folks it should not be included in the financial statements it should be it should be disclosed in the notes to financial statements that's basically how the accounting treatment works isn't it we should only recognize an asset if it's virtually certain that we will receive that okay folks however as of now okay folks in the current scenario it's not virtually certain that we will receive this particular or that we will win this particular legal action or legal lawsuit isn't it therefore you know ideally we should not have or ideally the finance director here should not have included this particular item in the financial statement and therefore that's definitely a road audit risk and we have to point that out what else during the year the company's credit controller was ill and was absent from work for 4 months which is fine of course we need to uh, you know if if an employee falls ill then it's normal right what else uh due to the staff shortages no replacement credit controller was appointed okay the receivables collection period has increased from 45 days to 75 days okay so our concern is not regarding the absence of credit controller but much rather 
this particular ratio over here. Okay, folks, receivable collection period has increased from 45 days to 75 days. What is the audit implication there? If there's an increase in the receivable collection period, that could indicate presence of bad debts. Has bad, like, have bad debts been properly included in the trade receivable balance? Like, have we considered them? Yes or no? Okay, that's, that could be a risk. Okay, folks, if they haven't, then there would be an overstatement of uh, the assets, basically trade receivables, isn't it? So that's basically something we need to highlight. What else? An instance of payroll fraud was also discovered during the year. Okay, so this is that particular instance uh, where we have to comment on the fraud-related procedures as well, isn't it? So just keep a note of that. Okay, folks. So a payroll clerk has set up a number of fictitious employees and the wages were then paid to the clerk's own bank account. Okay, that's a huge fraud, right? And what else? Controls ha have now been implemented to prevent this from reoccurring and the clerk involved no longer works for the company which is great, right? We fired the uh, fraudulent employee from the organization. So, you know, risk is reduced. But yeah, what else? However, the audit manager is concerned that additional fraud may have taken place in the payroll department prior to the, com uh, prior to the controls being implemented, which imposes a huge audit risk, isn't it? The presence of one fraud has indicated that there could have been other frauds before we they have in, in implemented the controls. So that's like a high level of risk, like control risk as well to a certain extent. So we can definitely include that within the uh, audit risk, isn't it? And what else? Yeah, that's just it, isn't it? And the last point is William Knight would like the audit to be completed by 30th, 31st October 2005. Okay, that's their preference. But yeah, still, okay. So there's a... Kind of a rush in completing the other procedures as well but yeah anyway choice we're not talking about ethic ethical threats like uh, intimidation threat or anything here so that should not be a point uh but yeah coming back to the uh answers so that's basically the scenario we've understood the scenario and we've highlighted many many instances that indicates uh, the uh, an audit risk as well isn't it so uh let's answer each of these uh requirements one by one shall we so let's have a look. So folks, this particular uh, requirement wants us to explain how each of these sources of information would be used in the audit to obtain an understanding of Knight Electronic School. Okay, folks, so let's uh, explain that over here. So for the first source of uh, information, that is prior year audited financial statements, what will I write? Why do we use the prior year audited financial statements for? Well, we basically compare the current year figures with the prior year to understand trends and patterns and everything, right? And then uh, what else? We have a look at the financial figures, of course, within the financial statements to understand the, the size of the organization, its financial structure and all these things, right? So you just have to simply mention that. Okay, folks, how many marks is this for? Five marks, okay, folks? And we have five sources of information as well, isn't it? So for each of these sources of information, we simply have to state what, it, what it's for. Simple as that. Okay, folks, so uh, I'll just say that this information, I'll just uh, switch the caps, yeah. This information is used in order to compare the current year figures with the prior year figures, or I'll just write prior year as, uh, as it is, prior. To gain an understanding of trends and significant fluctuations it can also be used for understanding the size and financial structure of Knight Electronics as this is a 
new client. Okay, folks. So as you can see here, what I've done is when I exp express my answer, when I presented my answer, I also included a few of the uh, things like uh, the scenario specific information like what client we're auditing. Okay, folks, for example, I noticed that this client was a new client. So since it's a new client, I can definitely look at the prior year financial statements to understand its size, understand its financial structure, what proportion of equity does it have, what proportion of debt does it have, all these things. Okay, folks, all the uh, assets and liabilities, balances and everything, right? So that's basically what I've mentioned over here. Okay, folks, so this will get you an, uh, one mark. Well, it's kind of worth two marks, but yeah. Uh, you just have to write for one mark in the exam, okay, folks? And secondly, uh, what else? Current year budgets and management accounts. What do we use the current year budgets and management accounts for? Well, uh, this uh, information can be used to obtain an understanding of the management's expectations of the current year balances of the current year figures at the planning stage of the audit and can be Specific, especially useful when conducting interim audits. Okay, folks, something like this. So what have I done here? Basically, like at the planning stage of the audit itself, if we are able to obtain an understanding as to what the management's expectation is regarding the uh, regarding the current year figures, then we could compare them with the actuals to see if, you know, to see how accurate they are, isn't it? So that's basically something that we can do as well. And it can also, uh, you know, uh, enable the auditors to see if whether the management's expectation is realistic, like are they, you know, having realist, are they using realistic assumptions, like uh, practical assumptions, etc. all these things. Okay, folks, so that, that's basically uh, the idea here. It can help us assess the management's judgment to a certain extent as well, isn't it? And what else? Uh, we also have the prior year report to management as well, isn't it? What is report to management? Basically the management letter, isn't it? Basically the report which has been provided to the management by probably the previous auditors of Knight uh, Electronic School. Uh, indicating like or mentioning the internal control deficiencies if there were any and stuff like that, isn't it? So I just have to mention that, okay, folks. So, uh, you know, this information can help the auditors understand as to whether there were any internal control deficiencies in the prior year and it can give them an understanding Well, it can uh, evidence as to whether the management has actually implemented all the control recommendations provided by the previous auditors. Yeah, that's just it, isn't it? Uh, this information can help the auditors understand as to whether there are any internal control deficiencies in the uh, prior year. Uh, and it can evidence as to whether the management has actually implemented all the control recommendations provided by the previous auditors as well, isn't it? So that's basically as to uh, what or how we can use this particular information, isn't it? What else? Board minutes. Board minutes. Uh, 
this these minutes can be used to obtain an understanding of the or of night electronics cause current business scenario and their plans and activities as well for the current year isn't it that's basically as to what we use the board minutes for for example if they are uh, you know taking some sort of, uh, they're planning some sort of an acquisition or something or if they're planning to expand the business or something like that then we could identify those from the board minutes itself isn't it so something like that okay folks and what else uh, company website uh, the website can be used to obtain information in relation to the company's products or you can just mention uh, you know night electronic cores specifically on his products and business model okay folks simple as that so that's basically it okay folks so this is basically how you can uh, provide an answer for this particular question kind of easy it's just a uh, simple things that we've already learned i just uh, you know mentioned it in some fancy words that's basically it okay folks so simple as that now uh moving on to the next requirement audit risks isn't it we have to identify eight and we actually have identified all eight isn't it uh, when I'm shifted to the next requirement, the highlight seems to have been removed. But yeah, I know where where to find each of those. Okay, folks. So uh, yeah, that's basically as to uh, you know how like 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 how to tackle this particular uh, requirement. Okay, folks. When they say eight audit risks, what do we have to do exactly? Well, we have to follow a structure here. Okay, folks. What structure am I talking about? Well, basically, you have to first of all identify the risk. Let me just write it over here. For each audit risk, okay, folks, we have to identify the risk, uh, explain why is it a risk, and then explain the impact of financial statements. So what does this mean exactly? Identifying the risk, explaining why it is a risk, and explaining the impact. Because if you mention these three things, you can easily get that one mark for each audit risk. Okay, folks, you remember that. Now, uh, how exactly do you identify the risk? That's kind of easy. You just have to copy paste the instance from the scenario. Okay, folks, for example, I'll show you a typical example here. Uh, we know that Hercules, no, not Hercules, uh, this Knight Electronics Co. is a new client, isn't it? So I'll just mention that first of all. Knight Electronics Co. is a new client, one by... Hercules & Co, which is basically our audit firm, right? So I've identified a particular risk, right? But does it explain anything? No, not really. Okay, folks, it's just a simple instance that I simply copy pasted from the scenario. That's just it. Okay, folks, I have to explain why exactly is it a risk? Why, why, wh what is the risk in, uh, you know, auditing new clients? I could think of two things. Okay, folks, one uh, is basically that there's an increased level of detection risk since we're not familiar, since the auditors are not familiar with the client's accounting policies, the way they conduct transactions and all these things, right? So I'll just mention that, okay, folks? Uh, you know, since the auditors are not familiar with <clears throat> the accounting policies and the business of night electronic school there is a chance or there is an increased risk of or increased detection risk yeah there, there's an increased detection risk isn't it uh, as the auditors are not familiar with the client 
Okay, folks, you can either write this or you can also state that further the opening balances may not be reliable as the audit was not conducted by Hercules and Co. in the prior year, isn't it? These are the risks that are there in this for this particular instance. Okay, folks, so I've wrote that down. Two risks. Either uh, you can see that, you know, there's an increased detection risk since the particular auditors are not familiar with the client, or you can see that the opening balances are not reliable. Okay, folks, that's basically a common risk when it comes to any situation where your audit client is new. Okay, folks, so just keep that in mind. Now, uh, if this is the audit risk, then what should be my response to the risk? My response would be something like, uh, well, what is the problem? Like, because, you know, the solution comes from the problem, isn't it? The problem here is that there's an increased level of detection risk due to, like, since, or due to the fact that we're not familiar with the client. So what we can ensure is that uh, the audit team should, or audit firm, I would rather say, audit firm should ensure that a team of experienced auditors should be aligned to conduct the audit of night electronic school right a team of experienced auditors should be aligned to conduct the audit of uh, Night Electronics Co. and they should have the sufficient or they should uh, devote sufficient amount of time to obtain an understanding of the client. You folks, why exactly are we doing this? Because it's a new client, isn't it? And uh, what else? There should be procedures conducted on the opening balances to ensure that they can be relied, isn't it? And uh, since we're not talking about substantive procedures, I don't have to specifically mention as to what kind of procedures, but uh, just to give you an idea, what we can do is we could have a look at the pre previous year, uh, you know, audited financial statements, the auditor's report, right, uh, or the management letter and stuff like that to see if, uh, you know, there have been any misstatements or something like that identified, have the, has the management corrected these misstatements, or should they, is there a need to make an adjustment to the opening balances, all these things. Okay, folks, so this is what or just do, isn't it? So uh, I've mentioned a sample response over here, and what else? What's next, guys? What else can we uh, mention over here? Hmm. What other uh, issues did we identify? This particular company is considering uh, a stock exchange listing, isn't it? So uh, I'll just mention that over here. Control C and then Control V. Uh, experience high level of growth, therefore the founder. Yeah. So this is basically the instance that I've identified from the scenario, right? Now I have to explain why exactly is it a risk, isn't it? So why is it a risk exactly? Because if you are, uh, you know, getting listed on the stock exchange, then there are a few strict rules and regulations which you have to comply with, isn't it? And your profit image and stuff like that should be maintained as well, isn't it? So there's an increased pressure to the management to ensure that profits are not reduced beyond the threshold, isn't it? That's basically the idea here, okay, folks? So there's an inherent risk, okay, folks? So there is an, I'll just write it down over here. There is an inherent risk. present as the management would be pressurized to show a good financial picture 
of the of night electronic school to to obtain the stock exchange listing so what can the auditors do well they could do the generic thing isn't it they could uh, the auditors should ensure that they maintain just rewrite this over here yeah that they maintain professional skepticism throughout the audit and remain alert to any conditions or events that can overstate the assets and profits of Knight Electronics Co. Simple as that. Okay, folks, just a simple line, a generic rhyme line as well, right? Uh, that is, uh, you know, that should be considered for this particular risk because it's not a specific risk as I would say like an accounting issue or anything like that. It's a generic inherent risk due to a particular uh, event that's going to happen, isn't it? So I've mentioned that particular point and I'll obtain marks for it definitely. Okay, folks, so just keep that in mind. And now let's move on to a bit more stronger set of risks. Okay, folks, so let's have a look at that. So the next risk would be in relation to, I believe, revenue recognition, isn't it? So it said here that customers pay for the servicing agreement in full at the start of the agreement. And uh, what else? Yeah, nothing else. Okay. So I'll just copy paste this instance and say that uh, Knight Electronics Co's customers pay for the servicing agreement uh, for the three year servicing agreement in full at the start of the agreement. So what is the issue here? Why exactly is this a risk? And what is the impact of this risk on the financial statements? Let's talk about that, shall we? So uh, the overall idea here is kind of simple. As per IFRS 15, Revenue should be recognized as and when the performance obligation is satisfied. There is a risk that Knight Co. Electronics Co. might be recognizing the revenue of the entire three year entire three years of the contract at the first year itself right as per IFRS 15 revenue should be recognized as and when the performance obligation is satisfied it's basically a principal accounting principle which we have learned and there is a risk that the night electronic school uh, just please correct this might be recognizing the revenue uh, of the entire three years of the contract at the first year itself isn't it that could be a risk, isn't it? These guys might be recognizing the revenue of the entire three years in the first year itself, since the customers are paying in full, isn't it? So should that be the way? No, not really. Okay, folks, ideally, uh, I'll just write that as well. When ideally, 
the revenue of the second and third year should be recognized as deferred income. Okay, folks, this is basically the accounting treatment, isn't it? So I'm just briefly mentioning it. I should not waste too much time in explaining this particular accounting concept. Okay, folks, this is not an FR exam and neither is it an SBR exam. Okay, folks, this is a AA exam. So you should, you should not waste too much time explaining this. Try to explain it as brief as possible. But, you know, that doesn't mean that it, we should skip out on certain important points as well. But mention it very briefly. Okay, folks, so something like this. And then say that, uh, therefore... There is a risk that the revenue might be overstated for Night Electronics Co. Okay, folks, what have I done here? I've identified the issue. I've explained why exactly is it a risk and I've explained the impact of the risk as well, isn't it? So I'll get one mark for this. And uh, what should be the response then? Any idea what should be the response here? Well, the response is the is that the audit team, <clears throat> audit team should obtain an understanding from the management regarding their accounting policy for revenue recognition right that's basically something that we can first of all do right we can't just simply say that hey you guys are wrong right we have to first of all consider uh, you know what they have to say as well like how they are going about with the revenue recognition approach and then consider whether they're right or wrong right so that's basically the idea here and what else? Or just, just let's just complete the sentence. Okay, both revenue recognition and ensure that it is in line with IFRS 15. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea. You can also conduct other things like uh, maybe recalculate the uh, amount recognized for one of uh, for a sample of a contract right and see if they have calculated the numbers appropriately as well right so there are multiple other procedures as well but yeah we only have one mark here so let's not waste too much time okay folks move on to the next aspect how many risks have we identified three right so yeah quite a few more uh, let's have a look at the next one five more to go so uh, what's the next one say they've increased the price of components right and therefore, this led to a reduction in gross profit margin. Okay. And uh, the inventory is valued at cost as well. Okay. So what should be the risk over here? So I'm just going to copy paste the instance first of all. Uh, what's the instance? It's basically from this particular paragraph itself. I'll just copy paste this and just rephrase a few things just to make it, make it a bit more, uh, you know, in an answer format. So prices of the components have steadily increased over the past, uh, leading to a reduction in uh, gross profit margin. And then it is also said that the inventory is valued at cost as well, isn't it? However, the inventory is still valued at cost. So folks, if there is a reduction in the gross profit margin, okay, folks, then, uh, you know, there is a chance, okay, folks, there is a risk that the uh, inventory may be obsolete. Why, how exactly is that possible or what's the connection exactly? Well, the idea here is this, okay, folks, the prices of the components have increased, right? And considering that this is a business, obviously the selling price would also increase, right? So if they have increased the selling price, you know, uh, depending on the uh, increase in components as well, then chances are that customers may not buy certain products and therefore the sales would have reduced as well. Now, the exact reason as to why gross profit margin has reduced is not provided to us. Is it is it due to lack of profits? If it's due to lack of profits, then chances are uh, that, you know, the sales would also be a lower amount as well, 
Okay, folks. So therefore, we could speculate that this could be the risk. Okay, folks, that we could say that, you know, there is a chance or uh, there is a risk that the net realizable value or NRV of the inventory may be lower than the cost according to I is two inventory should be valued at the lower of cost and NRV. Therefore, there, therefore, the inventory would be overstated and as a result assets of nightco and electronics co would be overstated simple as that okay folks what am i saying here i'm just saying that uh, you know ideally inventory should be valued at the uh, at the lower of cost in an RV, but since there was a reduction in the gross profit margin, uh, you know, and since they are still valuing inventory at cost, uh, even though there is a chance uh, that, uh, you know, the NRV might be lower than cost, there, there could be an accounting issue, isn't it? That's basically the idea here. And I believe I need to add one more line over here. Hmm. You know what? I'll just re realign this. Okay, folks, I don't think yeah, now it should be fine. According to this, this is the accounting principle. There's a risk that the net realizable value uh, of the inventory may be lower than cost and therefore, and uh, as a result, inventory may not be valued as per the standards. Something like this, okay, folks? Yeah, now it makes more sense. And uh, what should be the response here then? If the inventory is not valued appropriately, what should be the response? Well, uh, we could ask the management regarding the regarding as to why they, you know, they're still considering the inventory at cost. But, uh, you know, uh, considering all the other risks that I have, management discussions are kind of kind of like a frequent response that I'll be using. So instead, uh, what I could do is maybe I could say that the audit team could take a sample of inventory uh, and agree its cost to the purchase price and to the year-end uh, sales price to ensure that the cost is or the NRV is above cost. Okay folks, this is something that we can definitely do. What exactly am I suggesting here? Uh, first of all, just compare the cost to the Purchase invoice, okay, folks, or to the purchase, yeah, purchase price, right? Purchase invoice. Let's just say, say purchase invoice. Why are we doing this? Just to confirm as to whether we've recorded the particular inventory's value at the cost, at accurate cost or not, okay, folks. That's one thing. And secondly, uh, we can compare this particular cost to the year-end sales price to ensure that uh, you know it's not sold for a lower price, okay, folks. So that's basically the idea here. Because if it is sold for a lower price than the uh, you know, actual market price, which they were expecting to sell. That effectively means that there was an NRV and they haven't accounted for it, right? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, simple as that. Now, moving on. What's the next issue? Revaluation of premises, right? Uh, Nightcore decided to revaluate the premises, which has been previously this, and then, uh, yeah. 
I'll just copy paste this particular line. Properties with the carrying amount. Under the cost model of 3.8 million, we're revalued at 8.4 million based on a valuation performed by management. So what is the risk here? Why exactly is it a risk? There is a risk that the valuation may not have been done in accordance with the relevant accounting standards, isn't it? So I'll just simply mention that. Okay, folks, there is a risk that this revaluation may not have been conducted appropriately in accordance with the relevant accounting standards. Uh, and I'll finally say that as the management may be motivated to overvalue the premises and therefore overstating the assets of Nightco Electronics motivated to overvalue the premises and therefore always trade the assets of night uh, electronics go simple as that okay folks is the sentence complete let me quickly read reread this there is a risk that uh, this revaluation may not have been conducted appropriately in accordance with the relevant accounting standard as the management may be motivated to overvalue the premises and therefore overstate uh, overstate the assets of night electronics go okay folks so simple as that and what should be the response? Well, uh, the response should be that the audit team who has conducted the revaluation is that mentioned? No specific mention was, no specific person was mentioned for this, right? So yeah, let's just leave it be. I'll just say that uh, the audit team should discuss with the management <clears throat> uh, regarding the rationale and how much how much times was this always like increased exactly well if I divide 8.4 with 3.8 how much will I get where was the enter key? Yeah, there it is. More than 2.2 times, right? Uh, ra the rationale behind increasing the value of the premises by approximately 2.2 times. Okay, folks, that's something that we can do, like obtain an understanding as to why exactly have they, you know, doubled the amount? Okay, folks, is there a valid reason or not? If there is, it's fine. Okay, folks, however, if not, that could be an issue, isn't it? So simple as that. And what else? Uh, another related risk in relation to this line itself was in relation to the uh, the uh, non-current asset useful lives as well, isn't it? So uh, the finance director carried out an extensive review of non-current asset lives and decided to extend the useful life uh, of planned and equipment from five years to eight years. That's the next risk. Why exactly is it a risk? Well, the risk is that there is a risk that the management, no, not the management, the finance director may have uh, reduced the useful life in order to reduce 
the depreciation expense and therefore boost the profits of Knight Electronic School. Right? So this could be the reason, isn't it? So I've mentioned that. I've also explained the impact on profits as well, isn't it? That's basically how you should phrase it. Okay, folks. Uh, so therefore, the audit team to discuss uh, or should discuss the rationale behind extending the useful life because guys as per the standards it is fine okay folks it is fine to extend the useful life as per the standards if you have a reasonable basis for it okay folks so that's basically why we're asking them like is there uh, a, a rationale like a commercial rationale behind uh, you know extending the useful life or not okay folks uh, and they can also physically inspect the or physically verify the condition of the plant and equipments to see if the are in good conditions or in operable conditions for the for the next uh, eight years or so right so yeah this is something that we can also suggest to the audit team as well give folks to just uh, physically inspect some of the uh, you know plant and equipment and see if like the, are they actually in a condition because some of them would be worn and torn due to usage right so due to this usage like can we still use these particular machineries for the next uh you know uh remaining useful life of let's say eight years or something like that right so that's basically something that the audit team can do as well what else what else can we write is there any other risks how many risks have we written we've written one two three four five and six right so we need two more risks so let's have a look as to what else we can write shall we the next risk is about uh, the receivables collection period isn't it so i'm just gonna write down over here there we go uh, and uh, i'd need to expand it a bit a little bit uh, this particular increase happened due to the absence of the credit controller isn't it so what exactly is the uh, you know problem with having this particular issue of increased receivables collection period? Well, let me explain. There is a risk that the yeah, there is a risk that this particular thing, as in this particular uh, receivables balance, right, may be overstated due to or as the irrecoverable debts as there is an increased chance that as there is an increased chance that the <clears throat> irrecoverable debts may not be included appropriately okay folks so that's basically the idea isn't it because there would be an overstatement in the receivable balance and therefore an overstatement in the asset since they may not have considered the irrecoverable debts appropriately isn't it and the increase in uh you know i'll just write that point as well the increase in receivables collection period indicates this 
simple as that okay folks so uh, have i explained the issue yes i have have i explained the impact of the issue yes there is an overstatement in the receivable balance isn't it simple as that now what should be the response here well the audit team what they can do is uh, they can maybe have a look or they can review or test the post year end a common procedure when we uh you know when there's consideration of uh irrecoverable debts coming in okay folks for a sample uh, of receivables okay folks test a sample of the post year end cash receipts for receivables to ensure that the Uh, to ensure that the receivable balance has been valued appropriately. All right, simple as that. Okay, folks, or you can also mention that, hey, let's just discuss with the management as to what the consideration they have given for this particular issue is as well. Or we can also suggest we could test. The team can uh, test controls in relation to providing credits to customers to ensure that they are operating effectively and unnecessary credits are not provided to risky debtors okay folks something like this okay folks so since there's an absence of a credit controller are the controls still operating effectively when issuing credits to a new customer and stuff like that okay folks so that's basically something that they can uh, have a look at and what else finally uh, we need to just need one more right and we can just mention the uh, control risk here okay folks due to the payroll fraud uh, i'll just write write it down over here Mm, controls have now been implemented and then the audit manager is concerned that additional fraud may have taken place in the payroll department prior to the controls being implemented in relation to the payroll fraud okay let me just rewrite this my bad The audit manager is concerned that the additional fraud may have been taken may have taken place in the uh, payroll department prior to the controls being implemented. There, what is the risk here exactly? The risk is that these additional fraudulent activities may go undetected and therefore and there is a chance that there could be material misstatements within the financial statements due to those undetected frauds okay folks so that's basically 
as to what we are mentioning here and I'll say that this can increase or I'll say that uh, yeah this can increase control risk as well as detection risk for auditors okay folks so there are two things that can happen the controls may not be operating properly and therefore uh, you know there could be misstatements material misstatements in the financial statements due to fraud and of course there is a chance that some of these frauds may go undetected by the auditors as well and therefore uh, you know like if the auditors will not be able to detect it then there's an increased level of detection risk as well isn't it they may provide the inappropriate op opinion right so that's basically the uh, idea mentioned over here so uh, what we can do is the audit team should discuss with the management regarding the procedures that they have implemented to make adjustments as a result of this fraud identification and review the controls that they have introduced to see if they are operating effectively as well okay folks so what are we doing here we are discussing with the management uh, as to whether as to what this what the steps they have taken uh, or they have implemented what kind of procedures have they implemented to identify these additional frauds that are there and uh, you know have they identified anything have they made adjustments as necessary or not okay folks so all these things can be uh, mentioned as a response to this particular event so have we mentioned eight risks most definitely yes right so that's basically how you tackle this particular question simple as that I'll just delete this there we go yeah so that's basically the idea okay folks always remember whenever you're writing audit risk identify the risk explain why exactly is it a risk and what is the impact of that risk in the financial statements as well and of course when it comes to response be very specific to the situation that you're mentioning uh you know if nothing comes to mind you can write generic things like um, indeed professional skepticism and stuff like that but you know that's just a last resort okay folks so just keep that in mind now moving on to the next aspect we have substantive procedures right so what kind of substantive procedures should we perform to obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence on the uh, on this particular client that is night electronic scores revenue let's have a look at that shall we so folks my first procedure can be something specific to the particular scenario okay folks so that's basically something that you have to keep in mind when tackling questions in doubly like if you can write some uh, substantive procedure which is like specific to the scenario all the more better Okay, folks, as a last result, I know that you may have by heart at a few of those, uh, you know, procedures uh, here and there, but the examiner does not appreciate pre-learned procedures. Okay, folks, that's not what the examiner wants. What the examiner wants is for you to consider the scenario and then write those procedures which is appropriate and specific to the scenario. Like for here, we know the business model of this particular organization and what they do, right? So they have these service agreements and they're recognizing, uh, you know, the revenue. Like there was a risk that we identified that uh, in relation to revenue recognition, right? So maybe we can write a procedure specific to that particular aspect, right? So I'm just going to write that down. First of all, I'll select a sample of the servicing agreement. And then I'll agree the, let me just correct this, there we go. Not agree, right? Recalculate, my bad. Uh, we can recalculate the
the revenue that is to be recorded for the current year and the amount that is to be classified as deferred income to ensure that the classification and revenue recognition is in line with IFRS 15. Okay, folks. Now, whenever you're writing a substantive procedure, ensure that it includes uh, two elements. Okay, folks. What needs to be done and why we should do it. And you have to be very specific about it as well. Okay, folks. Now, in this particular uh, procedure, what I've highlighted here is basically the what needs to be done portion, right? We are selecting a sample of the servicing agreement. We're recalculating the revenue that needs to be recorded for the current year and, uh, you know, what needs to be included for deferred income, right? And why exactly are we doing this? What's the purpose of doing this? This is so that we can ensure that the classification has been appropriately done and uh, the appropriate amount is uh, recorded as per IFRS 15 as well, right? That's basically the objective that I've mentioned here. Okay, folks, simple as that. So what needs to be done and why we why we do it as well. Okay, folks, so just that needs to be those two elements is, is like mandatory for all procedures, all substantive procedures that you write. Now, uh, moving on, what else can we write? Uh, well, we can, uh, you know, talk about the completeness, right? There's no specific assertion given in the scenario. So we can talk about the completeness of the balance as well. So uh, what I can say is for a sample of revenue, or sales transaction <clears throat> obtain the customer order and agree them to the goods dispatched notes Give them to good dispatch notes and further ensure inclusion good dispatch note and invoice as well. Okay, folks, an invoice and further ensure inclusion into the sales ledger accounts. Okay, folks, now. Why exactly are we doing this? This is what needs to be done, right? Now, why exactly are we doing this? To ensure the completeness of the transaction. Simple as that. Okay, folks, to ensure the completeness, what are we doing here? We're obtaining, uh, you know, the customer order of a sample uh, of uh, revenue transactions, sales transactions, and then we're agreeing the details to the goods dispatch note and later to invoice. And later we're ensuring that it has been correctly included within the sales ledger listing as well. Okay, folks, simple as that. Now, what else? We need three more, right? What other procedures can be done? We can obtain uh, a breakdown of the invoice listing and recalculate to ensure that the invoice total is accurate. A simple accuracy, you know, procedure. That's basically all that there is to it. And it has those two elements, right? What needs to be done and why we're doing it as well. And uh, what else? We could, uh, you know, like, let's say that we're in a situation in the exam where you're not getting any other procedure for that matter. Okay, folks, so if such a case comes, then you can write some, uh, you know, uh, account specific procedures or account relevant procedures uh, that the examiner can value. For example, you could conduct, uh, you know, as of now, we've conducted test of details, right? You can think of it from a analytical procedure route. What kind of analytical procedures can you, can you conduct over here? Well, we can calculate the gross profit margin, right?
and compare it with the prior year to ensure that there are no significant fluctuations right uh, or you can also write that uh, one second yeah so you can also write that you can you know compare the revenue figure the total revenue figure with the prior year again to identify as to whether there is any significant fluctuation and investigate into it right that's basically something that you can write uh, and uh, what else we're talking about revenue so sales if there are sales then there probably would be sales returns as well right so uh, let's say for a sample of credit notes Trace through the original invoice to ensure that it has been correctly excluded from sales. Because it's a sales uh, return, right? So has it actually been excluded? So we're just testing that for a sample of credit notes as well. So five procedures, five marks. Simple as that, right? So that's basically how you can tack, uh, how you need to tackle the substantive procedures. Okay, folks, always ensure that you're writing two elements. What needs to be done and why we are doing it as well. And remember, guys, do not write pre-learned stuff, right? You know some examples. You may be familiar with the procedures. So uh, you need to write procedures which are specific to this particular scenario, to, to this particular account as well. Okay, folks, so do not write pre-learned or generic procedures for that particular matter. Now, uh, another thing is that your substantive procedure should not be generic. For example, don't say check something. Okay, folks, uh, some students write like check this instead of uh, and check, check this, check that, check this particular support, check, check that particular support, etc. So please don't write that because the word check is not that specific. Okay, folks, it doesn't really say like, for example, if you are, let's say, hired as an audit staff, uh, you know, uh, to me and I'm telling you check a particular report. Okay, folks. What exactly should you do? Should you recalculate the report? Should you just go through the report once? Should you just compare that report with another? Right? It's not specific, right? So you have to be very specific when writing your substantive procedures uh, in a way so that you know uh, a common on its staff would be able to understand. They should be able to understand what they need to do, okay, folks, and why they're doing it as well, okay, folks. So just keep that point in mind as well. So that's basically all about this particular uh, you know, requirement. Now moving on to the final requirement. Okay, folks, so what exactly should be done here? We need to write four relevant points in relation to uh, the procedures that should be undertaken during the audit of Knight uh, Electronics Co. So let's have a look at this, shall we? Again, guys, the one key important thing that you have to remember here is that they're specifically asking for procedures, isn't it? So therefore, all these four procedures should contain what needs to be done and why we do it as well, isn't it? So I'll write the first thing first of all. Like, uh, what was the issue again? Uh, let me just uh, re refresh your memories uh, on that particular aspect. A payroll clerk had set up a number of fictitious employees and the wages were then paid to the clerk's own bank account as well. Okay, folks, so what we can do is we can conduct procedures like, for example, you can compare the list of employees to their employment contracts, for example, right? This is a high risk area, right? So, uh, you know, if the number of employees is like uh, a little more, maybe 20 or 30 or something like that, then we could, uh, you know, conduct <clears throat> this particular procedures on the entire population. Else if it's, let's say, uh, hundreds or 200 or something like that, then we will do it on a sampling basis. Okay, folks, so remember that. Now, uh, what we are trying to do here is we're taking uh, the list of employees and we are uh, comparing them to their uh, employment contracts. Or uh, what else? <coughs> or employment contracts from the human resource department to verify their existence. 
Like, are they actual employees of the company or not? Okay, folks, or is it a fictitious or bogus employee, as we call it, right? Uh, we agree the bank details and stuff like that, and we can verify, uh, you know, as to whether the names and all other details are matching or not. Okay, folks, that's one thing. Or you can physically, you know, verify that person as well. Okay, folks, for example, you'll take a sample of the em employment contract and then, uh, you know, physically inspect as to whether that employee is working in the office or not. Okay, folks, simple as that. Okay, folks, so these are some of the procedures that we can do. And secondly, now, whenever there is a fraud, uh, fraud that has been discovered, the most important thing that you have to do is you have to test the controls. Okay, folks, like we noted that one particular control is not operating effectively. There is a fraudulent activity. So does the other control also have the same thing? Okay, folks, so that needs to be mentioned. How do we mention that? We can review and test the controls that are surrounding the processes like... Uh, payments made to employees <clears throat> or I would say process like setting up and payments made to employees especially new joiners to verify as to whether their are any other fraudulent activities taking place in these areas? Okay, folks, have I mentioned what needs to be done? Yes, I have. Have I mentioned why we're doing it? Yes, we have, right? To detect more frauds. That's basically the idea. <clears throat> now, uh, what else? What else can be done? Two more points are needed. Nothing comes to mind, right? So uh, what we could do is we could think of some of the generic stuff, right? Can we read both minutes here? Most definitely, yes, right? We can read both minutes or so review both minutes to ensure that, or not to ensure, I would say, uh, to obtain an understanding as to how the management is dealing with this with the discovered fraud the financial impact of the fraud on the financial statements and corrective actions that are taken to detect uh, to prevent such events from happening in the future. For example, for the next year as well, we will be conducting the audit, right? Like if we, they are not taking any corrective action, then that effectively means that for even for the upcoming audits, it's going to be uh, a, di a bit difficult as in there would be fraudulent activities uh, and material misstatements in the financial statements, right? So we're just obtaining an understanding like what's their process. Like, uh, or it can also be, uh, you can phrase it in another way as well. Instead of saying uh, what's going to happen in the future, you can say that, uh, you know, have they or... Uh, Let's say corrective action, not corrective action, I would say. Uh, uh, let me just reread this line. How the management is dealing, the EAL, dealing with the discovered fraud, the financial impact of the fraud on the financial statements, and uh, the process or their plan, I would say, their plan to detect any related fraud in the payroll area because that's more relevant right so yeah in the payroll area okay folks so this particular line uh, would get you marks and uh, finally what we could do is we could 
always obtain a written representation from the management acknowledging that they have disclosed all information relating to the fraudulent activity to their knowledge okay folks this particular supporting evidence can also be obtained just to ensure that uh, you know the particular management is acknowledging that they have disclosed everything okay folks so they have they communicated all the information in relation to the fraud that they've identified okay folks so that's basically the idea over here so yeah that basically gives you four marks right four procedures four marks and uh, always remember guys i've mentioned like what needs to be done and why we do this for all of these procedures as well isn't it uh, otherwise you won't get the complete marks available okay folks so just keep that in point in mind so yeah that's basically all about this particular question as a whole i hope you enjoyed it i hope you learn all the exam techniques as well uh, that has been discussed uh, throughout each of each of these requirements so guys carefully read the requirement carefully uh, read the scenario highlight all the information and use these exam techniques to ensure that you're scoring scoring the full marks available for the exam okay folks but yeah that's not it that's not just it we also have to discuss one more thing isn't it so let's get to that so folks, these are basically the 20 questions that you should do before you attempt your upcoming exam setting. And I'll tell you the reason why. Okay, folks, let's take the first uh, six over here. Okay, folks, these questions are basically audit risk related questions. Okay, folks, not just audit risk, there are also elements of uh, substantive procedures and other uh, direct theory questions as well. So uh, I found those, those direct theory questions to be quite interesting and uh, you know, all those uh, audit risks, the explanation as to how they provide, uh, that what they provided for these audit risks were also kind of interesting as well. So I highly recommend that you go through these, uh, you know, uh, all these questions such as Panzer Construction Co, uh, Blackberry, Hurling, Night Electronics Co is something that we just covered. So you're like, you know, one step ahead, we've already debriefed that, right? And then uh, Corley, Appliances Co, MacPeep Co, as well as Lapis Co as well. Okay, folks, so go through these questions, like do it on your own, first of all, type in your answer, and then uh, look into the answer and try to debrief it. Okay, folks, so that's basically uh, what I would recommend for audit risks. And then we also have some questions for uh, the control deficiency as well. Okay, folks, now one point that I like to point out here is that it's not just going to be about pointing out the control deficiency. Okay, folks, there would be some, uh, you know, sub uh, direct theory questions. There would be some questions where you may have to identify key controls and uh, talk about what's good about the control that there is, that there's al already in that particular businesses as well. So uh, based on all of these or, or after considering all, the, all of these variety of questions that can be tested, I've made a list of these questions. Uh, Equestrian Co, uh, Comet Publishing Co, Raspberry, Silver Co, uh, Castle Courier Co, Daily Co, as well as Petra Co. Daily and Petra is like my personal fam favorites and uh, those are like the most uh, recent questions that uh, ECC has published as well. So I would highly, highly recommend that you have a look into these particular questions as well. And uh, as for substantive procedures and other, uh, you know, uh, other uh, questions in relation to other related topics, uh, what I would suggest is these questions, okay, folks, at least try to do, uh, you know, Andromeda Industry School, uh, and then Airsoft School, Gooseberry School, Latte School, and then Perfect as well as Pacific School as well. Okay, folks, so it's not uh, majorly these questions cover uh, a really variety of substantive procedures in relation to certain assertion specifics and accounts. So I would highly, highly recommend these, uh, you know, questions before you, uh, you know, go to your upcoming exam, practicing this question before you go to your upcoming exam. And uh, it's not just that there are also elements of uh, audit reporting as well. Okay, folks, sometimes you may have to when it comes to the exam, you may have to explain what the impact on the auditor's report would be if there is a particular misstatement or if there is a particular accounting issue, etc. Right. So those kinds of questions are also covered over here. So, folks, these are like the bare minimum questions that you have to do for your upcoming upcoming exam. OK, folks, so because I don't know these 20 questions, they cover majority of the syllabus. Right. And it covers a lot of variety of questions at that as well. So it's like the bare minimum. But if you have time, I would say practice as much as possible. 
and it's all past paper questions as well and if you require a debrief video of each of these questions then uh, I highly highly suggest that you reach out to FinFam to get the revision boot camp because we've debriefed all of these past paper questions uh, within that particular revision boot camp it itself so uh, that's basically uh, what I wanted to cover in this particular session I hope you enjoyed it uh, I hope you've learned a lot and I hope you are uh, you know pumped up to uh, do some more questions all these 20 questions as well so uh, thank you so much guys prepare well and I wish you all the very best for your upcoming exam.